represents that a photon has gone from one to two, we represent that by a wiggly line for no good reason. <laughs> to represent a photon going from one to two. Now the next thing you have to do, that's the first law of physics. The second law of physics, that's all about optics. That's the entire theory of light. <laughs> it is, it is, it really is. The part that's not in it is how the light interacts with matter, and I'm coming to that. Next law, that has to do with electrons. Oh, I did cheat a little bit, yes, wait. I told you about polarization of photons, which I left out here. It also turns out that an electron has two states of polarization, too, which is sometimes called spin states. And again, I'm going to leave them out because they only, they don't add anything to the idea. They just add a little complication to the formulas, which you're not going to work with right now anyway. So if you want them, I'll tell you the exact laws. But this is very close. With electrons, we have a similar situation. I draw, just draw the same diagram because I used up my paper and I rolled it away. But if this was time and this was space, we can ask the following thing. If the electron is known to be started here at a position in time which I call 1, it has a certain amplitude to arrive at another position in time, 2. It then will go from 1 to 2, which I'll draw with a straight line to distinguish it from the photon case. And we need a formula for the amplitude for an electron to go to 2 from 1. And that's a different function of the 2. That is a number that depends on a 2. And I'm going to write it down here. No, it turns out a little harder to write that one. It turns out that that one involves not only the time and the x, but also another number in the formula. It's more complicated than this. And that other number is a characteristic of the electron. It's called its mass. And I'll tell you in a moment a little more about it. Uh, in other words, what it's this thing really depends on the position 2, the position 1, and the number m, e, the mass of an electron at rest. Mass of an electron. If you put the right number in for that, then that's this thing for electrons. If you put zero in for that, that's a photon. That's this one. That's D. And as you'll see, for every known particle that we hope in the end, for every point-like particle that behaves like a point, it's got to be this way with some m. We can deduce that alone, this formula for this thing, from relativity and this business about the probabilities adding to one. The only possible function is one, a particular one here, which I haven't written down, but I write it symbolically. It's an arrow, which is an amplitude, a complex number, which depends upon the two positions and on some number. In the case of an electron, that's a particular numerical value. Now, it would be nice if, for me to finish the job and write down the formula for that thing, but uh, I can't make it understandable to you, because unless you have some more, uh, enough mathematical background to appreciate decimal points. So, but I will tell you a little bit about the function. A special example. A special example, in fact, of the use of such a thing. Suppose that we have a situation where we know at the present moment, time is this way as usual, and space is that way. We know at the given instant that the electron is e equal amplitude, exactly the same amplitude, to be everywhere in space. Then the question is, with what amplitude will I find it at this particular place later? Answer. It might have been here, and then it would go to there. Or it might have been here, and then it would go to there. Or it might have been here, and then so on and so on. So what you do is you take for each one of these places, for these two points, the value of this E, and then for these two points, the value of E, and you add them all together, because those are all alternatives. It might be here, it might be here, dot. I could write it this way. The amplitude to arrive at point 2 from places 1 
which are all different values of x at a particular time t1, we'll call it t1. This is mathematically complicated and frightening. But all I'm saying here is exactly, perhaps I better not say it this way. What you do is you take the amplitude to go from every one of these points to here and calculate it, add it together. In other words, you add this thing for a given time, but all different places. And then the answer is very simple. The answer is a simply an amplitude of a certain of a unit length whose phase, whose angle, angle here, goes around depending on how much time it's been from here to here. Sounds to me, but it's not a photon. And that rate at which it goes around is very high. It's something like one point some odd times 10 to the 20th. That's 130 million million oscillations a second. Right? At that time, at a the speed at which this is going around, if you change this time, is uh, characteristic of the electron and measures its mass. Furthermore, it's pretty obvious that the amplitude to arrive at any other point is exactly the same. Because there are all the same amplitudes back here, and if I started with another point here and drew all those arrows and everything, it would be the same picture. So the amplitude to arrive everywhere is again the same, but has a different angle. So if the amplitude to be everywhere in space is exactly constant, the amplitude to be everywhere in space stays constant, but changes its angle only. And the rate depends on the mass. The particle whose amplitude is uh, the same to be everywhere in space is corresponds to a particle at rest stationary in the normal parlance. Also, I told you, when an amplitude is such that all it does, it doesn't change anything except in time by turning, by changing the angle, it's a state of constant and fixed energy. An electron at rest has a definite energy, which is called its mc squared, I think, its mass of the speed of light. I've taken the speed of light to be one in the units I'm using, so that uh, this just goes around depending on the mass. If I had had a heavier particle, the situation would be the same. I'd put a different number in here, and it would just be that this amplitude would rotate faster in that case. Anyway, there's a simple example of the, one of the properties of this function, which is very, very simple. As a matter of fact, if you're clever enough, you can deduce from this, plus the principle of relativity, what that function was. But you're not that clever, so we won't say. And I'm just wanting to try to emphasize that the particular function, although I haven't written it down exactly, is as simple almost as it can be. Finally, there's one more rule. And that is that if an electron comes to a point at the same with a photon, they come together at a point, an electron and a photon, that an electron can go off from there. So it's possible to have a junction. And there's an amplitude that there's a junction. The amplitude that a photon is absorbed by the electron, let's say. Or whatever kind of a junction is that. We can talk about what the junctions mean. But every time you see a junction, you get an amplitude. That amplitude is given by a formula. C is equal to 0 0.08542, and so on. A number, just a number. One number. Uh, physicists like to remember this number in the form 1 over C squared. Uh, when they write C squared, 137.03599 plus or minus 3, and that's the result of an experiment. That's a magical number, a mysterious number. Good theoretical physicists put that at the top of their bed at night and dream and dream if they can figure out why that's the right number. <laughs> the fact that we have, we have no idea where that number comes from, and it's one of the mysteries and incompletenesses of the theory, because it would be nice to get that number out of something. Uh, it's done by experiment. I'll discuss that problem in much more detail in the next lecture when I talk about the limitations or the incompletenesses of the theory and also other particles in nature and all the other problems of uh, physics more complete, not just electrodynamics. Well, now we see we have just these parts, and I would like to discuss calculating the amplitude for a number of different events so that you can see what's involved. So the first example 
will be this. Suppose that I have two electrons, again, time this way, space this way, and so on. I have an electron, I know its state at position one, and time, the position time one, mark one here, and another one at two. And I would like to know whether at a later time I will find one electron here, well, let's stop putting it in the same place, and another electron, say, there. All right? So one electron should be at three, and the other at four. Now, to find out how to do it, the first thing I do is I suppose that the electron number one went to three, and the electron number two went to four. So I draw a picture like that. And I read the picture mathematically as follows, that the amplitude for this event is the product, as we talked, uh, because these are two independent things, there's one factor, which is the amplitude that this gets from here to here, which is just that E thing, you see some arrow. And there's an amplitude that gets from here to here. If, you're, if I were writing it mathematically, I'd write E31 times E42, but what I would mean is, get from the formula the size of the arrow here, and then I multiply it by the size of this arrow, and that would be the answer. But that's not the complete and exact answer, because there's another possibility. So I must consider other possibilities that can occur. Another possibility is that it was this electron that went to there. I'm just drawing the same picture over again but make it a, de a recombination. This is one, this is two, this is uh, three and four, and the amplitude for this one would be E three from two, E four from one. And from what you've learned last time about photons, if it can happen in two different ways, you add the amplitude. But for electrons, there's a different rule. When it can happen in two different ways for electrons, you subtract the amplitude. This subtraction has a very profound and remarkable influence on the behavior of electrons, and is the reason why electrons behave more like particles experimentally than like waves when they were first found. I'll talk about. I'll come back to that in a few minutes, in a little while. Let's forget this for a while, and let's talk about just situations like this, that somehow you know it's the same electron going here. This subtraction is extremely interesting. But I'm going to come back to that, because I want to concentrate on something else. Well, there's another way that the first thing can happen beside that exchange here. And that's this. It could be, here's the particle at one, and here's the particle at two, and the particle that goes to three, and the other one is going to go to four. Now, I had them going directly. That was the first thing. But you must add an amplitude for every possibility. So we have to keep on going and adding something. It could be this. Number one could go to a some place in time and space, which I'll call position time five. The electron can go to here. Yeah. And then go from five to three and make a junction here by emitting a photon. And the other one go to the other point where the other end of the photon is six and goes to four. Now, if you're brave enough, I'm going to write the amplitude for this thing in a high-class mathematical fashion, and you'll be able to follow it. The answer to this amplitude for this contribution here is the following. E35, E51, and uh, E46, 